I am a technology artisan, specialized on wearable tech and smart materials. Now you all have in your head a concept of what technology is and a concept of what being an artisan might mean. Okay. Now I'm going to give you my own formula, which is these two words, means and meaning. Now two words that have the same origin, but are today currently quite separated. But they shouldn't be, and that's what I'm going to explain. Let's say that means is technologies that are materials, technologies that are tools, and technologies that are skills and how to use materials and tools to create products. Now, because I work in the fashion and wearable arena, this is the kind of industries I'm gonna use as examples. So, here you go, a very basic example, yeah? If you know deeply these materials and these tools and you have these kind of skills, you can make this kind of product, right? Now, if we translate this to the future of knitwear, which is perhaps 3D printed materials, you will need, um, in order to achieve quite a high level of innovation, you will need to be an expert on this kind of materials, this kind of tools, and this kind of skills. Now, no wonder today, craft and technology are so far separated. It is almost impossible to find in one unique person all of this expertise together. That's why collaboration is everything, and that is one of the main parts where we are going. Collaboration, and obviously, multidisciplinary collaboration. Now, it is not the first time that this happens in history, again, with the theme of fashion and textiles. This is the 18th century when the sewing machine had to be domesticated and come into the homes. They had engineers and artisans working together to make these machines appeal to their consumers. And now, today, we have engineers together with doctors, athletes, and designers coming together to design wearable technologies, prosthetics, and implants that can make us superhuman. Now, this really can make anyone believe that everything is possible. It truly is. Everything is possible. We will say that we have the means. And if we didn't, we will make sure to orchestrate the most complex and intricate network of earth and human resources to achieve our goal. And to transport those products to your door and then, unfortunately, here. And this is the main question about where are we going? Why is this happening? Now there is this phrase that says, nature abhors a vacuum, right? But humans have fear for a different kind of emptiness. And while we have been very keen to create growth and consumption, we have forgotten to create meaning. And that's the main thing I wanted to transfer to you all today, is that it is no longer enough to have all the means, all the materials, the tools, the skills, the technology, if you do not have the meaning. And that's where we are going. Technologies have evolved enough that now there is no excuse to not listen to our consumers, to not allow them to customize or modify the products to their real needs. We have no excuse to not care about what's happening in the world or our environment. And something that not many people talk about is do we even care about the makers, the people involved down the chain? Because unfortunately, through the evolution of technologies and industrialization, this is probably where the problem lays, really. It is that we have so far removed the distance between consumers and makers. But now, ironically, it is technology who can bring this back through transparency and communication. This is how most of the things you wear right now have been produced in a way that is meaningless to the makers and finally meaningless to many of us. Now when we are talking about technologies, this is even a bigger issue. Al Gore says 
or technologies combined with our numbers have made us collectively a force of nature. And I want to add to that that it has made us collectively a force of change. Now it is up to us to make that change meaningful. And this is what is called design activism. We can all be here. We can all actively promote change through the products we design. It is not just a responsibility, it is a privilege. Think about it. When you design a product that people are going to consume, it's going to change the way they think, the way they behave. This is ultimately a really, really high privilege. Now, if you can even move forward, try design activism. This is about allowing people to actually modify the products that you have designed. And it's an area that I'm fascinated about, especially because of how kids react to this, how much kids like making things. It is very important because this is the moment where we can inspire them to be engineers. And now I'm going to talk about a few of my products. The first one is an educational toy. And it got me thinking that not only there is very few engineers, but it's only 8% of them that are women. But wait a minute. Now technology, it's becoming closer to fashion. Everybody's talking about wearables. This might be the perfect opportunity to understand that if that is what girls enjoy, let's use this as a tool. So why don't we mix what girls like with what we want them to learn and make educational toys this way? I'm going to show you quickly the CP kit. that you will be surprised how many girls really are actually asking to learn electronics with it instead of feeling forced that they have to. I was actually a researcher here in Scotland at Distance Lab and I have been very interested in local industries and I was very interested in wool and knitwear. Unfortunately, this is right now, although being in the past one of the major industries in the UK, it's only 3% of exports that are about wool and knitwear. And I thought there must be a way that we can innovate this material as well to generate growth locally. So now is the moment where I ask one person of the public to come here and the rest of you to hold your phones with the flash on. Okay, what's your name? Abby, okay. You're just gonna try this on. Okay, and you're gonna tell everyone what you think it is or how it feels or you can look forward. Yeah. I'm fairly soft. <laughs> come over here. Yeah, I think you have to come over here. Yeah. Um, it's fairly soft. It's quite warm. Uh, yeah. yeah. Will you wear it? Yeah, yeah for sure. Okay. Now if anyone wants to take some pictures with Flash, please let me know what you see. Yeah. Go on. Don't be shy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You don't know what's happening at all, okay? No, this is actually a highly fashionable product. It's locally produced with the Scottish wool, and it's highly reflective. This product can actually save your life when you're on the bike, on the streets, your kids when they're at school, etc. We're gonna go from keeping warm to global warming, much more of a serious issue. It is something that I've always been keen on using smart materials, especially those that can change color under the sunlight to promote global warming awareness and also skin cancer research. So I developed this jewelry project where I have been for many years trying to integrate these kind of chemicals into crystals to create jewelry that appears to be white indoors and then changes color as soon as you go in the sunlight. And here we have some pictures of the crystals growing and here, finally, uh, the full collection. This is how it will look indoors. That's how it looks outdoors when the color bursts. I'm going to end 
here showing you the video about this collection, which is a one minute video, while I hope you reflect on the whole concept of ensuring that in the future we don't only make the most of our means, but also of our meaning. <laughs>